and welcome you back to another episode of Justice for All Now. Today's show will be reflecting on the work of Burma Task Force with Adam Kaur, along with co-host Fozi Sayed and members of the Long Island Bangladeshi Muslim community, both of whom are staff members of Burma Task Force. We will be focusing on the impact of COVID on refugee and refugee policies. Last week, our Burma Task Force focus show went viral in Malaysia, where popular sentiment has turned dramatically against the Rohingya refugee population there. Today, fears of the contingent are mounting, and although the region and through the region, some refugee boats have been allowed to land, and others have not. We consider with, with our guest, the well-known Rohingya scholar and community advocate, La Mainit, how we can address the root issues of displacement, including the rise of xenophobia in Burma. How can the international community support the Rohingya refugees in Cox's Bazaar? In part two of the show, we will introduce Hans Dieckmann, a top expert in human rights and asylum law in Germany. The global refugee crisis is global, and European countries have also struggled with xenophobia and legal responsibilities. What are the lessons of Germany, which has allowed so many Syrian refugees to arrive as refugees and has so far been managing its COVID crisis better than many European countries? What tools of international law can help the cause of the Rohingya and other displaced people? To discuss this, I welcome Adam Carroll, Justice for All's Burma Task Force. Thank you, Sister Hannah. And uh, I'm also welcoming onto the screen Sister Fauzia of Fauzia Syed. Um, you're sideways, though. If maybe you can change. Yes. Um, you're sort of popping out of the wall. Um, <laughs> yes, if you could just turn. It, to the side, uh, your camera. Is that better or no? It's Doesn't, no, you're sideways. Uh, you have to change the camera orientation. Um, we uh, are going to be talking a little bit with Sister Fauzia about um, the Long Island um, uh, Muslim community, just very briefly, the impact of COVID. And uh, Sister Fauzia, are you there? All right, if you're oh, sideways. Yeah. If you're sideways, we can accept that. Um, but uh, uh, sometimes we all have to be, sometimes we're sideways, all of us. Um, so uh, as far as um, the situation now where you live, it's Westbury, Long Island. Uh, I think the Muslim community and the Bangladeshi American community has been very, very hard, hard hit. I was wondering if you could just say a few words about your community there. Um in regard to being hit by COVID-19. Okay, yeah, so I am from New York, I live in New York, and um, our community definitely, in general, in general, all of New York has been hit pretty hard, I think the hardest in New York. Um, I mean, not in New York, in the US rather, uh, and particularly um, immigrant communities uh, have been hit the hardest, poor communities, um, and that is mostly because of the situation uh, around which these communities live. Um, a lot of cramped up spaces, a lot of uh, a lot of family members in one residence, right? Um, a lot, a, a huge part of the immigrant community being affected is also because of the fact that they make major they make up majority of essential workers, right? Um, a lot of doctors, right, just in general, and a lot of doctors and medical professionals, professionals, nurses, um, the physician assistants make our Muslims, right, or immigrant Muslims, um, but also essential workers in the sense that workers that have to go to work that aren't getting paid like these, like medical professionals, right? So those that work in groceries, those are in the gas stations, um, one group, especially uh, home health aides. There's a lot of home health aides, right, that are taking care of uh, patients or uh, people in 
that have health problems inside homes. And those tend to be a majority of them tend to be immigrants. And a lot of them are Pakistani or Bangladeshi uh, immigrants and they were also they were also in need of PPE, the protective equipment, but they weren't getting it right. So, um, because of that, there have been a lot of uh, deaths due to COVID, but also um, also a lot of like economic loss with jobs and things like that. So, um, yeah, it's been pretty bad, and mm -hmm. I think yeah. So I, I think uh, also um, you know while the the death toll and the contagion uh, is more dramatic right now in New York City than many other places. Um, people are also anxious about the situation back in Bangladesh. Um, earlier, we were discussing um, the, the uh, plight of uh, Rohingya in the camps, but also the various people uh, who are um, uh, in the region. Bangladeshis themselves. So as far as, as the current concerns about Bangladesh go very briefly, uh, what are your thoughts and concerns? So, I mean, to be, so I, I, I can see firsthand the experience of being a New Yorker and also seeing how a lot of like my immigrant family or friends or um, family friends are dealing with COVID. Every single person that I know has either lost someone or knows someone they've lost. But even more so, I know that when we talk to these families, I can speak as someone who's a uh, Bangladeshi here and part of the community here. When I or any of our family members speak to others here, they're even more concerned of their for their families in Bangladesh, right? I spoke to someone who lost someone here of COVID and immediately after talking about that, 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 that particular situation they were facing, they immediately spoke of, oh, but in Bangladesh it's so much worse, or I'm so scared for my family. Um, uh, the, one of the concerns has been the, the lack of, I guess, action by the Bangladeshi government, right? Um, and the lack of, um, separate uh, lack of not like the lack of access to information right um not being told the truth about co about coronavirus what it actually the the gravity of it right not and that lack of access in, of information also extends itself that's just the general public right um because their hope from what i hear and what i've also read of course the whole what bangladesh is hoping it seems is that they don't want to create a frantic uh, chaos, right, among people, right? And they just want to keep uh, fears down and they want to keep everyone as calm as possible, right? Um, but this, like lack of access to information and all, all these other things extend to the camps as well, right? Um, and then if you, you, if you, when you see how Bangladesh is dealing with uh, the situation of a, a potential coronavirus spread in the refugee camps of the Rohingya, right, largest refugee settlement um, in the world right now. Um, a huge part of that is the lack of information or the lack of access to information because since last year, it's been very well known that they've reduced or cut off internet completely right, in the refugee camps. And a lot of concerns, specifically if I speak about the Rohingya, are around the fact that, A, they can't get information, right? Um, because there is no internet, there is a lack, they are unable to uh, spread the correct information about uh, the coronavirus. And um, B, even if there was, and access to information, right? The government has put so many limitations on NGOs as well. Um, if there's multiple articles, like, and there's multiple uh, non uh, NGOs, such as Amnesty International, Human Rights Watch, there's India medical organizations that are saying that they are trying to get the right information across. Things as basic as like, how do we prevent this disease from spreading? Washing your hands, like medical campaigns, but they're completely unable to do that because 
the government, unfortunately, Bangladesh as a whole, is not allowing that information to be shared. You know? so, okay, uh, I think, uh, yeah, I think, Sister, um, it, today, in fact, is International Press Freedom Day, so it's relevant that you're speaking about uh, free access to information and and that the limitations in many countries, including Bangladesh, but also United States, it, it's yeah. it's made the pandemic uh, a more stressful and and uh, been uh, now. Um, I think that um, we need to move on to talk about some of the root causes of displacement because, of course, Bangladesh didn't cause the Rohingya crisis. Uh, it was Burma that did that. So we have um, a Rohingya on the line um, who's calling in from Australia and is going to join us. And we're going to ask him a few questions about um, about that. So if somebody could add on um, uh, uh, Mr. Uh, La Mint, please. Um, we'd like to have him on the screen. Yeah, Saikum, good to see you. Ramadan Mubarak to you. Mubarak to you as well, my dear friend. Uh -huh. Uh, my name is Tula Mint. Uh, hello, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, I represent our kind of international organization. I am a senior member as well as a uh, chair of Foreign Affairs Committee. So I will be answering any questions that you would have in your mind uh, to the best of my knowledge and ability. You go ahead. Yes, thank you very much. Yes, we do have a few questions. Um, and uh, wanted to start off with, um, first of all, uh, you were uh, teaching here in the U.S. and uh, you also teach in Australia. You're yes, in I, Australia I, I, now. Yes. Yeah. Uh, due, due, due to the global pandemic, uh, at the moment, I think I'm better off to stay in Australia than in the U.S. I certainly. I'm based in Boston. Uh, I am. I'm based in Boston. Uh, I'm engaged with Boston University as well as a university here in Australia. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, uh, how many uh, Rohingya live in Australia? There are about 3,000 Rohingyas living in Australia. Mm, yeah, and and um, are they all in Sydney uh, or well, are they scattered uh, around? Well, they are scattered around the east coast of Australia. So 1,000, uh, each city like Sydney, Melbourne, um, Brisbane, each city has uh, approximately 1,000 Rohingyas living in between these areas. Mm. Uh, yep. ma many of them uh, uh, are settled down. All of them have been given a, a, either a safe haven or a refugee visa. Uh, but I, I came to Australia a long time ago. I'm an Australian citizen. Uh, That's uh, great. I, I, I think that some of Australia's refugee policies have been uh, criticized uh, yeah, with uh, I'm, the use uh, of islands. Yeah. I'm aware of that, but compared to other Western nations, uh, Australia is mm -hmm. much better than those countries. I'm not defending Australia, I'm being objective here. Why? Because uh, all of those boat arrivals who came to Australia have been initially or gradually have been, they have received a visa. But there are some rules that you have to follow if you come to a country. So uh, mm -hmm. you cannot bypass those particular rules. I do have sincere sympathies to all asylum seekers all over the world because I myself come to Australia as a political refugee. So I understand how it feels like to be a refugee and where you come from, and the, the reason that you came to, the reason that you flee your own country. We, we're facing this as a, as a as a whole community in in back there in Burma. So I understand how it feels like. But however, there are some rules and regulations that you need to follow, unfortunately. And uh, I wonder if Sister Fauzia, if you're still on the line, if you'd like uh, to ask the next question about uh, uh, camp conditions. Yeah. Uh, with respect to uh, the Rohingya community in Bangladesh, uh, hello. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we do take this opportunity to recognize and appreciate the generosity of Bangladeshi government. Uh, as Bangladeshi uh, government and people are hosting one million refugees at a time. Much of the international dependent on the sea over the sea. We also make urgent appeal that to the honorable prime minister to continue her compassionate uh, assistance towards the Rohingya people. In addition to that, I'd like to add a, a couple of combination to the COVID nineteen in Bangladesh refugee camp. I think that situation in the camp and it's uh, and it's deteriorating, it's getting more soft. 
the fear of COVID-19 is there, and it is a grave concern over there, but there's not much of the facilities to uh, to, uh, to to combat it. So we are more focused on the bringing the awareness of the COVID-19 within the country, and we're also concerned of the local change of attitudes, and we think that enemy is playing um, uh, behind the scene to make the situation more tense against uh, um, in a situation like local versus the Rohingya refugees in, in the area of Fox Bazaar. We hope the people in the future will not fall into a ploy that being orchestrated by the Burmese regime. In addition to that, the Burmese regime is also well known for its, its, uh, its, uh, its uh, inhumane and psychological assaults and misinformation. Even the recent violence in the kind of state are systematically orchestrated by the Burmese military itself. That's right. There's uh, the uh, Burmese military has refused to abide by the UN Secretary General's call for a global ceasefire, even though many of the militias have agreed to do that. Um, and we see that the number of uh, killings and disappearances have been increasing again in Rakhine State and Chin State and elsewhere. Yes. Yes, uh, I agree with you. Yeah. Um, because uh, I think I think if I may add on that particular situation, we are not the only ethnic group in Burma who has suffered under this brutal regime. Burma has been in the state of civil war ever since its independence, seventy years, so more than seventy plus years. So, especially the ethnic ethnic group like the Chin Chin people are also subject to mass atrocity crimes like genocide and war crimes that has been brutally committed by this regime over the last seventy years. Sister Fausia, would you like to uh, <laughs> would you like to ask a follow up question about Burma? Uh, your mic is on mute. Hello. Yes. Hi. Hi. Yes. Hi. Um, you mentioned that uh, you kind of, you touched upon a little about the um, conflict in Burma. Is there anything you want to add? Um, yeah. In regard to why you think that this conflict, this uh, aggression against the Rohingya, still continues to this day, it's been something that's been going on for decades, right? Even before decades, right? Well, so, well, uh, uh, there's two two two, two, uh, two comments that I would like to make. If you want to know, I will enlighten the situation. The Rohingya people are the one of the indigenous group of Burma, but unfortunately, due to our race. Due to our religion, we've been ignored. Okay, we've been uh, we've been denied our citizenship rights. As a result of that, we've been subjected to severe persecution. We're not allowed to move from one place to another place. Suppose you live in New York. Suppose if you want to go to within even within New York, if you want to go to Times Square, uh, uh, a place like Times Square in Mondo or in Rakhine State, you need special permission. So our freedom of movement is really restricted. And you're not, we're not allowed, um, those who are adults, they're not allowed to get married, they're not allowed to go to jobs, the children are not allowed to go to university schools and the youths, they're not allowed to go to universities, and pensioners are not allowed to have their pensions, and the old who need medical attention, they're not allowed to have their access to health care. All of the fact, all of the privileges and rights as a human being has been systematically deprived of in Burma as a Rohingya. We've been considered as a human being in Burma. So as, as a result of that, there have been uh, numerous of protests. One was in 1978, the other one was 1992, and then 19, uh, 2012, 2013, 2016, and 2017. In 2017, the amount of atrocity that have committed is constituted ground for genocides or genocide and intent. So I would also like to touch on the ground about the ongoing uh, situation, the current situation on the ground, which is as we all know, the Arakan Rohingya National Organization is gravely concerned with the, uh, that the international community is uncritical by in of the Burmese government's effort against the virus that would further embolden it to continue its genocidal operation against the Rohingya and other ethnic people of Rakhine State, which are bound to worsen off, which are bound to get much more critical uh, uh, during the course of the spread of the virus. For it, for it is at least clear that the hundreds of thousands of the IDPs in the Rakhine State. IDP means internally the space camp. There are lots of IDP camps in Rakhine State uh, uh, since 2012, you know. The Rohingya people at the moment are the only people in the world 
who have been living in RDP camps within their nations. They have they they became refugees within their own motherland. So this is a very you know appalling situation. Um, and those who are in the refugee camps are both confined to concentration camp and newly displaced from the Burmese army strenuous air and ground offensive. So on top of that, those who are living in their residential areas in North American state have been subject to, you know, assault by Burmese army, particularly by its air forces. Uh, you will find a lot of videos, you know, the, uh, if you see the videos in 2017, you will see you know, one of the house was just blown into the air by either uh, a rocket attack or a missile attack from either from RPG or, you know, or, or from a helicopter. Uh, it's very you appalling. Had, you had mentioned, uh, Mr. Mint, that uh, 18 foreign ambassadors um, had called for the end of armed conflict uh, amid mm -hmm. the COVID pandemic, uh, yes. but that uh, it, it the statement failed to identify the Burmese military as the main aggressor. Yes, um, uh, that's, that's what I'm trying to emphasize here. <laughs> the Burmese government, uh, they, they medically, you know, the first victim of uh, COVID-19 was a Muslim in Burma, okay? Mm. Uh, when he died, he passed, he did not respect his privacy. The, the, and the way they portrayed the, him was a kind of like, you know, a uh, foreign, uh, he was traveling a lot, uh, he was making a lot of travels overseas. So instead of uh, respecting his privacy, they went to shoot uh, all his premises in in Rangoon and Rathwera. And people were trying to sing, I know, first I know there are countless of Rohingyas who have been, all other uh, Burmese cities who are all subject to the you know, who are not immune from, or, you know, uh, widespread pandemic. Oh. However, if you see the report in Burma, it's, uh, it's quite uh, other way, other other way around. You had mentioned that. Uh, to what you have said. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, you had mentioned that that mm -hmm. uh, since the ICJ ruling in January mm -hmm. of this year, there had been no mm -hmm. new international sanctions. And uh, what do you think, though, yeah. the Western investors? and World Bank should be doing now. I think you're an economist. Uh, what, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, well, yeah. Uh, well, I think the deadly spread of the virus is forcing the governments all around the world to reassess their priorities and to realize that all the cities need to be equally protected or all who are at risk. So they have to be equally protected. We ask the governments to transpose the new, uh, newfound awareness to Burma and also un uh, unconditional support to the government that is driving a large sectors of its population into arms of a pandemic will finally to be at risk uh, to be a risk to all populations. So we yes, have to um, know, uh, the, uh, yes, go ahead. Yeah. So, as far as uh, the international community goes, uh, what can be expected of the United Nations and its agencies during this crisis? Um, I know that well, you work a lot with the UN and you, you make a lot of visits to the UN here in New York a, a, in normal times and also you speak with other agencies. So what are, what is your advice and what are your what would you like well, to see? Before I, I go or go up into what um, I, before I answer directly to your question, I just want to give you a follow up uh, thematic uh, uh, timeline, you know. The post Holocaust promise of never again going to be a hollow for the victims of the genocide and mass atrocity crimes in a country like Iraq, Rwanda, as well as in Cambodia. More recently, there, there have been a number of attacks on international law and human rights with an alarming increase in mass atrocity crimes and genocide against the Rohingya people in Myanmar and in, in a, a number of countries. The UN Security Council has failed to adequately respond to catastrophic crisis in, Latin, in a country like Burma that has led to exponential su increased suffering of human suffering, particularly the Rohingya people. Although that has become a global, our issue has become a global crisis, one region in particular has borne the brunt of the resulting instability. Burma, as a result, must fully uh, comply with the decision of ICJ order and address all under nine conditions that will lead to a genocide, including by repairing and amending all the laws that systematically discriminate against the Rohingya people. The government should also urgently grant access for all UN agents and humanitarian organizations uh, to, 
to all conflict, uh, affected areas or conflict zones. Uh, the states who are parties to genocide convention should meaningfully support the case brought by Gambia through the public statement and legal intervention at the ICJ, International Court of Justice. International community must also act immediately to provide Rohingyas all their rights and also ensure a quicker repatriation in accordance with international convention. And international community, it means the United Nations, should also adopt the uh, recommendation that has been made by fact-finding missions and ensure those responsible for genocide and war crimes uh, and crimes against humanity do not evade justice. UN Security Council, uh, Council should act on the Rohingya situation and address the core issue of the Rohingya genocide. All investment in Burma should be conducted in a strict adherence with UN's principal um, guideline for business and human rights. And finally, as our kind of Rohingya national law, it was an the international community to fund 2020 joint response plan for the Rohingya humanitarian crisis in Bangladesh and support the Rohingya refugee empowerment, pro uh, empowerment program or development program, particularly for the women and youth children. Well, that's uh, a tall order, and I think it will require a lot of pressure uh, from yes, the international yes. community and partnership with Rohingya leaders like yourself yes, and your yes. colleagues at Arno. Um, yes. and, um, and so we just have about a minute left in this segment. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, so um, a, as far as um, you know, being in touch with uh, Rohingya, that you, I'm sure you're in touch with Rohingya around the world. Uh, what what a message do they have for the international community and for us? Well, we we need we need uh, we need the solidarity of the international community to solve our problem once and for all on a permanent basis. We're highly appreciative of the, the of the nations that are hosting our people. That includes Malaysia, Bangladesh, Saudi Arabia, Thailand, even Australia and the U.S. Okay. Uh, but we're not very happy with the government's attitudes in Burma because we are one of the indigenous people in Burma. We do have the right to be a citizen. You know, what's the irony is that we are very peace loving people. You see, if you see in Burma, all the ethnic groups in Burma are armed groups, unlike us. And the second point is that all the ethnic groups who are living in Burma are borderland people. For example, Kachin people speak Chinese, okay? Shan, Shan people speak Thai, and even in Bangladesh, you will find a lot of kind people. No, but it doesn't have since appear to be a problem for Bangladeshi government to recognize them as citizens. However, that's not the case for us in Burma. We have been living uh, before, long before the creation of Burma. Okay, there is a historical problem. Say Burma, is, it is not the Arakan. It is the Burma came to Arakan in 19, 1784. We were there long before that. Okay. We've been subjected to the uh, political game uh, and the power struggle between these two uh, power groups like Burmese and Rakhine people. On top of that, I have to say that our case is a burden. We are the victims of mass atrocity crimes, and mass atrocity crimes are international crimes. So, severity doesn't give a license to those governments to commit mass uh, to slaughter or commit genocide against the defenders of the people. So we need international assistance. Thank you very much. Uh, and thank you for being on the show. In the next segment, we're going to be speaking about international law as far as it, it relates to the refugee crisis and uh, specifically Europe, um, which is in um, a similar uh, role uh, in its uh, sometimes harsh um, uh, response to refugees uh, arriving on their shores. So thank you very much for being on the show and uh, we'll be in touch and uh, we're going to uh, say goodbye to you and Ramadan Mubarak. Ramadan Mubarak. Thank you very All much. Right. Thank you. Um, so we have another guest for the second segment and Fauzia, uh, do you have uh, the script in front of you? Would you like to introduce him? Oops, vanished. Okay, um, we have uh, um, Jens uh, Diakman, uh, who's joining us. Ah, yes, there you are, and uh, th and there's Fauzi again. Welcome to the show. Uh, are, are you there? You just vanished again? Okay, there you are again. Yes, uh, <laughs> uh, um, welcome. Uh, uh, welcome. <laughs> 
Um, and uh, so um, thanks for joining us. You know, this is uh, um, a, a show that um, has just started about um, two weeks ago. And uh, I'm only on it once a week. So um, we, in, when I'm on the show, we tend to focus on uh, Bangladesh um, and on Burma and uh, uh, other shows focus on other displaced people and persecuted minorities. Um, so um, the, the refugee crisis, those 71 million displaced and uh, refugee people, um, that certainly relates to your role in Europe um, working on asylum and asylee requests. So um, first of all, though, um, before we get into your own work, um, you're in Germany, and I was wondering um, if perhaps you could say something uh, about uh, the overall uh, atmosphere these days in Europe and specifically in Germany regarding refugees and migrants. Yes, uh, Adam, thank you very much uh, uh, for inviting me. Uh, can you hear me? Is it okay? Yes. Thank you. Um, yes, uh, in, in fact, I, I started to work for refugees in Germany uh, exactly 30 years ago. It was in April 1990 when I was a law student and I started to work for Amnesty International as a volunteer um, consultant for refugees. And you might remember um, after 1989, after the breakdown of the wall between East and West, a lot of refugees came to Germany. And so for me in the moment, there are a lot of deja vu moments when a lot of applicants, people, families came to Central Europe and asking for protection. And I can compare it with the response of society 30 years ago. And I can say that uh, the big difference is that civil society, NGOs, are much more and better prepared for the situation after 2015 as we have been prepared in 1990. Um, we have strong networks between professional NGOs and civil society actors, and, and I can speak for Germany, of course, in this, uh, in this moment. Um, Germany shifted from 1990 to today to an immigration society, regarding itself as an immigration society. And this is a broad consensus, and this was the base for uh, dealing with the refugees a situation in summer 2015, uh, let me say, perhaps more properly than other European countries, because there was a broad consensus uh, between the parties, the social society actors, and civil society. Nevertheless, um, saying this, um, there are some similar responses. We are dealing with uh, a growing number of xenophobic right-wing activities in Germany and Europe. In Germany, we have now a right-wing party in the federal parliament with a very aggressive, aggressive tone, speeches and proposals against refugees. So um, it's a lot of things to fight in daily work. We have an atmosphere where journalists are attacked by right-wing people. Members of parliament are threatened if they are engaged for refugees. So there is, in fact, a broad consensus among the majority, but it's under attack. And this was the situation now when the uh, COVID-19 crisis started. Um, so um, we have been prepared. We are dealing with integration during the last years. But of course, um, the corona crisis provoked a lot of difficulties. Uh, we are dealing with it in the moment as refugee lawyers. And if I may, um, perhaps at this stage, if I, if I um, may um, illustrate the most important problem we are facing in the moment, this is the problem of housing. Um, last year, the, the coalition of Ms. Merkel and the Social Democrats, they are passed, they are passed a new immigration and refugee law forcing people, refugees, to live not only six months, but 18 months regular in camps before they are transferred to normal local villages or cities. 
And so we have a lot of thousands of people living in this kind of camps when Corona virus crisis started. And uh, the biggest challenge as an asylum lawyer at the moment is to try to get the people out of the camps uh, because the government imposed a lot of regulations uh, to protect the health situation of the citizens and the people living in Germany to protect, prevent infection, all these things. But this is the same to apply on refugees living in camps, but it's not possible to, uh, to take care for them under these living conditions. Refugees are living there with four, six, eight people in one room. Social distancing is not possible under the circumstances. And so our problem, to put it very briefly, is a double standard. Under the, under the corona crisis now, we have a double standard problem that we are dealing um, uh, refugees under pressure with different medical standards than normal German or European citizens. This is the biggest challenge today. Mm. Well, um, compared to some of the other European nations where we've seen a lot of xenophobia, um, yeah. uh, perhaps Germany is in a little bit better uh, shape uh, though there are some political parties that um, are hostile. Um, you mentioned going back to the 90s, perhaps uh, people fleeing the Balkans. In fact, our group was founded at that time uh, as a uh, um, Bosnia task force instead of Burma task force. So we also uh, um, have a, a legacy um, of response. Um, but now, I mean, since 2015, roughly, when there was such a large uh, amount of Syrians arriving, um, uh, and now perhaps camps and housing, which are crowded, and which uh, I understand there's some news reports about COVID spreading in the housing in Germany, in Stuttgart, yes, maybe. Yes. Yes, um, yes. So is this driving up uh, any kind of um, media frenzy in Germany, or are people being quite calm because your overall response to COVID crisis or coronavirus crisis is seems to compare quite well with the U.S. at least? Um, yes, in, indeed, there are there are different different um, signals and situations to to observe. First of all, and quite quite interesting. Um, during the last two or three months, um, the numbers of supports for the right-wing parties, uh, the AFD, the right-wing party in the federal parliament, is decreasing. And the support of Ms. Merkel and the, the moderate conservative parties is increasing. So uh, the, the crisis brings the people together in the middle of society. This is my, my observation. Um, and. I do not observe any uh, increasing hostility against refugees in, in the context of this uh, coronavirus uh, situation. The key problem is the key problem is that the coronavirus situation is is um, um, motivating people to take care for themselves for their own interest, and the problem is to raise in the public uh, discussion, the issues of, uh, of refugees and their problems, for example, in this kind of, of camps. And uh, this is what um, uh, we are trying to do in cooperation with NGOs and with civil society. But our problem, for example, is um, to make a documentation of the situation of refugees in this situation. But our problem is, that most of the offices of the NGOs or social welfare institutions supporting our clients in the camps, for example, they are closed. So the people who are working at the front line with refugees, they are in home office now. And during the last weeks, we received a lot of calls of our clients, uh, calls for help, because they are not able, for example, to contact social security offices or some support staff, etc., because they are entirely isolated. And this is a problem we are facing now, and we are working uh, together with the welfare institutions and with NGOs uh, to improve the situation. Um, you talked about the response of German governments to this crisis. 
um, as I can explain um, how German federal government responded to the asylum uh, law situation. For example, the German Bar Association, so the highest representative of lawyers in Germany, we informed the German government about the problems refugees are facing to get uh, effective access to justice. So if there are negative decisions, how to organize um, under short deadlines to um, submit an appeal against negative decision. If the offices of the welfare institutions and NGO are closed and the lawyers, the specialists are living and working far away, the federal government ordered a suspension of decision. Up to this week, for, for several weeks, no negative decision because the government accepted our claim that it's not possible to organize an effective preparation of appeal under this given circumstances. And this was a quite good response, a quite reasonable uh, response. Secondly, most of the administrative courts dealing with asylum cases, pending asylum cases, they are cancelled um, uh, uh, trial schedules and postponed trial hearings um, to, to see and wait how the situation, uh, situation is uh, developing. So we had two or three months now um, some uh, suspension, a uh, suspended situation. And now in May, we are tr trying to start slowly and carefully uh, the judicial system and decision making process and to reorganize our contacts with the clients in the field, in the, in the camps. And so, so that um, it's this this machine is starting effectively again. Mm. Um, yeah, it it uh, it seems that um, you've worked uh, with many asylum uh, cases with people who are applying for safe haven in Europe. Uh, there's of course refugees, asylees, uh, forced migrants, all these different categories of law. Um, as far as the overall policy questions of different European states or of the EU itself, um, you know, one can raise issues about policy, whether they're in compliance with international uh, norms or international laws of human rights. And I know that you've worked uh, not only on individual cases, but on some uh, larger issues uh, in, the, in the international criminal courts of different sorts. Um, I see also a, an op-ed that you've co-authored uh, called um, The EU at the Door uh, for Crimes Against Humanity. Very interesting uh, as far as um, the collusion, perhaps, of the EU with, um, with possibly criminal states um, or how one would one quite categorize Libya uh, at this point. Um, so there's interesting ideas about holding nations responsible under international law. So I was wondering if you could speak around that. that, that. Yeah, thank you very, thank you very much. Uh, indeed, um, um, when, when I finished my, my law degree at university, um, international criminal law in The Hague, in fact, did not exist. Um, it, I, I finished in 1993 and it was just the year when it started with the ICDY and ICDR. Uh, and the Yugoslavia and Rwanda tri tribunals. Uh, in, indeed, I, I tried to combine my, my national refugee law practice uh, with international criminal law proceedings. And I had the privilege and honor and pleasure to represent cases at the Yugoslavia tribunal as well as the ICC. Currently, I, I represent together with a colleague from Senegal, Maître Hélène Sissé from Dakar, uh, 103 um, uh, victims uh, in a Darfur case, in a Sudan case at the ICC, uh, refugees from six different African countries who are accepted as uh, victims in this Darfur uh, case. Um, for me, um, as, a, as a lawyer, as a human rights lawyer, um, this field belongs together. Um, it was, for me, the same... Um, uh, the, the other side of the same medal, if you want to say it in this way. Because as a refugee lawyer, as an asylum lawyer, I represent people who are escaping from war, from, from civil war, from prosecution in the context of war. And in the crim international criminal law, you are dealing exactly with this war 
um, war uh, scenarios. And um, my observation during the last years, and this is quite um, shocking or astonishing <laughs> or surprising at least, um, um, in, in uh, refugee lawyers, do not norm, normally do not have a clue about international criminal law and international criminal law lawyers <laughs> do not have a clue on asylum law this is my my observation and in 2017 from the international bar association we have an annual conference and we started a, a panel discussion on exactly this issue to analyze the situation in the mediterranean sea from the international criminal law perspective you know, we have the Geneva Convention for Refugees, we have uh, human rights uh, bodies, we have uh, human rights forums, etc. Um, but due to my opinion, and uh, by the opinion of a growing number of international lawyers, international criminal law is a very strong and powerful tool to use and to, 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 to use and to make effective uh, use of uh, in the context of the migration crisis. Um, if you, for example, see the situation in the Mediterranean Sea, the European Union, for example, in the, in the mission Sophia, the, the European Union was active in the Mediterranean Sea with, with, uh, with airplanes, they supervised everything, they, they, they took anything on, on video and on radar, um, they had a lot of ships in the Mediterranean Sea. But in fact, they, um, they did not take over uh, the command in this refu uh, in, the, in the rescue activities. In, 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 in contrast, they, they trained and financed uh, Libyan government uh, institutions. Uh, and uh, so in, in fact, with European money, Libya was uh, taking over uh, people who are rescued in, in, in sea. And if you see what we have in information on the situation in, in Libya, it is quite clear that this is an entirely unacceptable situation. There, is, there are systematic violations of basic human rights. And in fact, European knows this. Europe knows this. Europe, Europe is financing this. European countries are cooperating with Libya in this context. And Europe is closing their eyes, and this is the, the, the most disastrous aspect. They closed the mission Sophia, they stopped it, and in fact they left the people alone in the Mediterranean area. And therefore I strongly support the initiative of Branco and Shabazz to initiate um, a kind of Article 15 submission to the International Criminal Court and to inform the court about these issues and to analyze it from the international criminal law perspective. And I think that there is a starting point to, for the ICC to analyze the situation under the term of uh, crimes against humanity by omission, at least, by omission or, in or because of the cooperation with, with Libya. Mm -hmm. The problem of the submission of Branco and Shabas, individual human rights lawyers from last summer is, the evidence. They used a lot of leaked evidence, WikiLeaks evidence, and I'm quite suspicious after nine years working at the ICC if the judges are willing to accept WikiLeaks evidence. Mm. So I am personally, I'm dreaming of a project, a comparable project run by major human rights and refugee law institutions like Human Rights Watch, like Amnesty International, the Coalition for the ICC, to, to prepare and to submit a paper under Article 15 of the, of the Rome Statute, analyzing to what extent European countries and government, and it means individual politicians, are responsible for the deaths or uh, the mistreatment of a high number of refugees just looking for safety in the Mediterranean area. And, but this is a long way to go. Uh, it's on its way. Um, but this is one of the projects I'm, I'm really trying to support and to bring these fields together, refugee law and international criminal law, because my observation is that human rights bodies or human rights courts, of course, you can address them. Of course, you can address them. But um, the consequences for the governments are not harsh, <laughs> not strict enough uh, mm -hmm. to, uh, to provoke a real change 
of government policies. If you see how long procedures in Strasbourg of the European Court in Strasbourg are pending, and in the end of the day, the government has to pay 10,000 euro or whatever, you know, this is not really hurting. This is not a motivation to change. But if you see that at the ICC, there are presidents, there are government members in the dock. And this is, uh, this is something, this is a game changer. And this is one of the strong, powerful tools of the ICC and international criminal law that every politician in power has to ask him or herself at the end of the day if everything was, in, um, uh, was compatible with international criminal law standards. This is fighting impunity. This is what the European Union stands for. Mm. And yeah, this is a long road to go. Well, in, in holding nations accountable um, for their responsibility to protect, um, they, um, you know, it doesn't help that European Union is making these uh, policies that are not so different from what we see in, for example, Southeast Asia. We can complain that Malaysia or Bangladesh are not allowing boats to land or are, you know, somehow not abiding by uh, international norms for refugees. Uh, many of the countries have not even signed on to uh, those. Um, uh, so uh, as far as um, trying to convince the world that uh, instead of hypocrisy, the, the rule of law does prevail, um, I'm wondering what uh, you think um, can be done. I mean, we see that with the ICJ case of Burma, um, that you know that was very helpful. Those provisional member measures are very helpful, but we're expecting in two weeks or so um, a response from the Burmese government. We'll see if it comes on time, or we'll see what it is, and we'll see how the international community responds to it. But until now, the Burmese government uh, uses this case for its own political agenda, its nationalist agenda. And, um, and I'm afraid that we'll see that if there are other international court cases, we'll see it become a circus of nationalism. So how does one prevent that? Um, the answer is quite uh, briefly. And in, in fact, I, I don't know, <laughs> <laughs> but I entirely share your analysis. Um, hmm. from, from, my, from, the, from the lawyer's perspective, I think, what we um, what, what what the victims uh, deserve is a, a very truthful um, 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 dealing with their expectations, and we must be absolutely honest with with them. We have to explain the victims of this genocide and of this uh, crimes against humanity. We have to explain quite openly how difficult and how long this way will be. And, you know, uh, I, I represent people in, at the ICC who suffered since 2007. And our case is suspended since 2015. So it's a long way to go. But the point is, um, the fight, the, the, there is no deadline. There is no way out for, for people in power to escape um, um, the powerful tool of international criminal law. It's a long way to go, and we have to use step by step any legal measure we have to make the sphere, the area of the government smaller and smaller and smaller. We have to use them all, human rights bodies, um, international political bodies, uh, public international law, the ICJ, uh, refugee law and international criminal law. Uh, to, to, make, to, to, to make it more and more impossible for this kind of governments to move or to attract investors or to build up cooperation. And finally, the people in the country will realize that they ended up uh, in the corner uh, with this kind of, of government. This is a strategy, step by step, to make the, the, the ability of these governments to move um, uh, smaller and smaller and smaller and uh, the ICJ order is so important because um, it's perfectly illustrate what we are talking about in international law that in fact uh, the, the, the country of Gambia 
more than 10,000 kilometers away from, from, uh, from, from Burma, is able to initiate this kind of proceeding because we are talking about the same legal standards. And, uh, and this is how, what this international law is about. If you are violating the principle of genocide, it's a matter for the entire world. And therefore, this is the perfect case. This is the perfect uh, uh, procedure to, to illustrate the values we are standing for. And, um, and therefore, I'm, I'm, I'm quite sure that this kind of initiatives will have an echo in public opinion and the response of public investors and uh, they will have an impact but we do not have to talk about timelines or we must be patient it's uh, uh, you must have a spirit of a marathon runner if you are one to be successful in uh, in in this in this field this is not cynical this is uh, um, i think uh, quite realistic but we this but we have to be realistic and we have to communicate this realism uh, quite openly. Well, the arc is long, but it bends towards justice, we can hope. And, uh, and in fact, um, you know, it's, uh, it's because of, of people like you that, you know, uh, who are working inside, who are engaging with the system, who are pushing it in the right direction, you know, and who have faith uh, in, in, and patience. Uh, that, that we can have some hope in, in, in justice in the long run. So, um, you know, whether it's the Rohingya uh, people or other, other groups who are being uh, uh, beaten with the sticks or at the short end of the stick, um, we, we want to make sure that the vulnerable are, uh, especially now with the, with the health crisis, um, remembered and included and uh, embraced as uh, fellow human beings. So. Um, Thank you very much for speaking with us. And I don't know if Sister Hannah is here for the close up. We are having, uh, not Sister Hannah, but Sister Fazia. We are having some difficulty with her image appearing sideways. Um, but we uh, ha do have an announcement of another um, uh, YouTube video that is we did uh, just last week. Uh, this is about COVID-19 in Bangladesh. It's relevant. And if you go to the uh, website, um, we will be posting the link to this um, on our Facebook and our YouTube pages. Um, uh, I speak on this and we are also dealing with some of the same issues that we uh, spoke about today, but our partner um, uh, Rise for Rohingya brought on some medical professionals working in the camps uh, in Bangladesh. So it might be of interest. So I'm winding up, Sister Hannah, I see you. And would you like to close us out? Sure, thank you so much. Oh, I guess that's it. <laughs> all right, well, um, anyway, thanks, Jens, and uh, thank you all, and uh, till the you, next thank time. Thank you, thank you. Okay. Thank you next time. Thank you, thank you. bye-bye. Yeah, Bye. thank Bye. you so much Take for care. being here. Uh, we've been playing around with scheduling, and I think we scheduled it exactly to end uh, at four, um, so that's why we went offline. But uh, grateful for you to be on the show and to be a part of this. Uh, we really um, admire your work and hopefully we can uh, have another session uh, specifically, maybe have some Syrians on here as well. So thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. It was a pleasure and honor for me to be with you. Thank you. Thanks, Jess. Thank you. We'll send you a link to the show so you can watch. Thank you. Now, how do I get out of the show? Here it is. Uh, no, brothers, <laughs> get brother Adam back in here. I need to talk to him. <laughs>